Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Brian, and thank you for all that you do. You really are uh, a, an extraordinary Australian, and we appreciate your contribution. Can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples? Can I acknowledge Rory uh, and his colleagues uh, and acknowledge and recognise the contribution to not just national security, but the broader discussion and debate about how we chart the course in the times that uh, Brian has outlined that Rory and the college make. Can I acknowledge the diplomatic members of the diplomatic corps who have been kind enough to attend um, a speech by a shadow foreign minister. It's very, your courtesy is noted. So the purpose of Australian foreign policy is where I wish to start. The purpose of Australian foreign policy is to advance Australian interest and values to ensure our security, our economic strength, and to shape the world for the better. We must build the, re the region and the world we want, one that is prosperous, peaceful, and in which sovereignty is respected. We must expand the choices and options available to us to enable management of differences without escalation to conflict. And we should act to generate and preserve global public goods that give form to our values and which benefit all nations, including our own. And to succeed in this, we must expand Australia's power and influence. This has seldom mattered more. We live in a time of great uncertainty. Many of Australia's challenges are without precedent. We haven't known such a vexing convergence of circumstances since the end of the Second World War. Rising nationalism, fraying multilateralism, great power competition, emerging, emerging COVID strains, an ever-warming planet and a more assertive China. We must face this reality. Our region is being reshaped. And this generation of political leaders has a responsibility in this reshaping to protect Australian interests today and in the decades ahead, to assure opportunities for the next generation as good as those created for us by the last. Our interests won't be advanced simply by a series of individual deals and transactions. Rather, the features, the architecture and the attributes of our region and of the international system itself are being contested. We're in a contest, a race you might say, for influence. Maximising our influence means we need to use all the tools we have. Military capability matters. And when I say military capability, I mean actual real capability, not announcements. But we need more than that. We need to deploy all aspects of state power, strategic, diplomatic, social, economic. The expansion of Australia's power and influence is grounded in a growing, resilient economy. So much of our wealth comes from the markets to which we export. But increasing resilience is not just about more diverse markets, as important as that is. The world's demands are changing and what we offer will need to change with it in order to maintain our economic strength. This is why it is in Australia's interests that we reinforce our economy's resilience by becoming a renewable energy superpower. And it's why we must have a future made in Australia, shoring up our resilience to supply chain failures and other economic shocks. But my focus today is how we need to better understand and better give effect to the role of foreign policy. Foreign policy must work with other elements of state power to succeed. In this, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Chief of the Defence Force, General Angus Campbell, has observed that the ADF, as an instrument of hard power, is best at shaping our environment and deterring behaviour that is counter to our interests. When it partners with all the other elements of national power, and in particular with our diplomatic service, our presence on an enduring basis out in the world. It is not a question of separating hard power to deter conflict and soft power to do nice things. Because most of the challenges that our region faces fall short of kinetic military conflict. Many of them fall in the grey zone. The example most resonant for Australians will be trade, increasingly a vector for geostrategic competition. Economic coercion and cyber intrusions are being deployed to pursue strategic outcomes and undermine agreed rules. And not far from us, the flouting of norms for exploitation of natural resources, including energy, water and fish stocks, risks livelihoods and regional stability. These are threats that can't be deterred by military might alone. 
Indeed, as the CDF says, the best way to confound, to respond, or to undermine those kind of behaviours is to be a force and an influence for cooperation, of capacity building and of common interest in the region. So foreign policy is not merely a stage for photo ops, but a critical tool in delivering our national security. I would also say that it is a disturbingly underutilised tool if we are seeking to promote and protect our interests and values. There are three drivers for expanding our power and influence that will be central to Labor's foreign policy that I want to discuss with you today. The first is projecting modern Australia to the region and the world. The second is fostering genuine partnerships grounded in trust. And the third is enhancing our capability in navigating international relations, including in the grey zone. Foreign policy starts with who we are. And we should understand what we project to the world about who we are is an element of national power. For generations, Australians have been advantaged across all of our in international endeavours by a reputation for being straight shoot shooters who pull our weight. That reputation has taken a hit, thanks to recent behaviour by the Prime Minister, a hit the Australian people do not deserve. But beyond that traditional reputation, we should also consider what is the broader story that we are telling the world about today's Australia. How we articulate modern Australia can constrain or amplify our influence, from a business seeking new markets to the promotion of our national interests in a time of geostrategic competition. There is vast untapped power in modern Australia. The world is multicultural, so is Australia, home to the world's oldest continuing cultures. 270 ancestries represented, one quarter of Australians born overseas, one half of Australians having a parent born overseas. This gives us the capacity to reach into every corner of the world and say we share common ground. It is a natural asset for building alignment that we are not deploying. Conversely, expressing who we are in narrow and exclusionary terms can inhibit the potential for alignment and it can diminish the cohesion of the Australian community. Recall Tony Abbott's championing of the Anglosphere. Consider how that was received in the region and heard at home. Recall Erica Betts demanding Chinese Australians denounce the CPC in a Senate hearing, not a demand made of any witness who wasn't Asian. And recall that our foreign minister was invited to rebuke Senator Abetz, but despite her responsibility to protect Australia to the region, she declined to show any such leadership. Narratives matter, as do perceptions. As we strive for maximum influence, we need to understand this, and we need to understand how our past attitudes and policy on race can provide others with the opportunity to promote narratives that limit our influence. We can counter that in part by articulating who we are, our place, and our shared stake in the region. And that includes placing the experiences of First Nations peoples, this land's first diplomats, at the heart of our diplomacy. Drawing on our vibrant multiculturalism, we can ground a narrative which enables the possibilities of greater alignment with others. And we can also strengthen our social cohesion, which is in itself the foundation of our sovereignty. We can express our values and demonstrate our interests. And we need to seize this advantage to tap into the power of modern Australia, to create common ground and to give us greater space to engage and to build alignment. Alignment matters because it is the basis of partnership, and partnerships are the second way we will drive an expansion of national influence. As a substantial power but not a superpower, it has always been critical for Australia to work with others to achieve our aims. And given the proliferation of challenges we face and the dynamics of great power competition, that need just keeps growing. Creative middle power diplomacy is what Australia used to be known for because partnerships multiply our influence. But a partnership isn't just a vehicle for a grip and grin photo op staged before a stockade of flags, nor is it simply a transaction. Durable and effective partnerships demand an alignment of interests. The more aligned, the more powerful. But a few th key things about alignment. It isn't a static concept. It needs work to generate, to sustain, and to develop. Australia needs stronger partnerships in the region if we are to shape it in our interests. And these should be based on alignment enabled by 
first, a deep and detailed understanding of others' perspectives and interests. Second, a compelling articulation of what is or what can be shared. Third, identifying and creating opportunities for collaboration. And fourth, demonstrating authenticity and trustworthiness. It is now beyond doubt that authenticity and trustworthiness are not qualities that are possessed by Mr Morrison. But notwithstanding that, it's clear the partnerships that need the most work are in our region. Much more effort is needed to address our shared challenges in the Pacific and Southeast Asia, and we need to treat Southeast Asia as the priority it is, starting with more support for the pandemic recovery and boosting the vaccine rollout. The Prime Minister's announcement of 60 million vaccines by the end of 2022 is a start, but clearly won't be enough to ensure full coverage and boosters for those who need it, or to strengthen frontline health systems in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. The government needs to ensure sufficient domestic manufacturing capability to deliver for ongoing vaccine needs in the region. Mr Morrison's short-term focus on temporary and targeted assistance is easily interpreted as piecemeal and uncommitted, especially given the government's short-sighted decision to cut health assistance to Indonesia by 80% prior to the pandemic. And we must also address the emerging pandemic, that is climate change. Calls over years from Pacific leaders for Australia to do the right thing on climate have been stubbornly ignored. Pacific leaders and Australians have come to the same conclusion. We are led by a government that isn't serious about climate change and never will be. And for proof, if more is needed, just look to the fact that before the Ambassador for the Environment's ink was dry on the communique, calling for greater ambition in 2030 targets, Senator Payne had disavowed it. As Julie Bishop said on Friday, this unreliable behaviour gives rise to a lack of trust in our diplomatic efforts and, she went on to say, our reputation is absolutely vital for broader national interest. It's clear that a credible Pacific step up will only happen under an Albanese Labor government, a government that recognises the existential national security and economic threat climate change presents to all, particularly our Pacific friends. And Labor understands this is essential to being a trusted partner of choice, to match our strategic ambitions and to build the region we want. The one that is prosperous, stable, and in which sovereignty is respected. And we will have more to say on these priorities in the coming months. Finally, the third driver is capability. Australia's ability to influence the reshaping of our region is highly dependent on the capability of our foreign service. And this capability goes to both comprehending the scale and features of the external environment and the ability to identify how and where alignment can be initiated, fostered and strengthened. And it goes to our diplomatic capability as the key means by which we put foreign policy into operation. Our foreign service has many talented and skilled people but they have been hampered by a lack of leadership, degraded resources, and a lack of clarity as to how they are expected to deliver for Australia in these changing times. DFAT needs clearer political leadership and a sharper understanding of its role, responsibilities, and its potential in these times. And it needs the tools to deliver this, including every building of our development assistance program. But there has been too much unnecessary collateral damage to Australia's national interests. We know that these short-term plays were a reflection of Mr Morrison's character and the obsession with announcements at the expense of doing the whole job. But it seems to me that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the national security community more widely should take the opportunity to review their advice to government and in general, and also with particular reference as to the handling and implementation of the submarine announcement. An Albanese Labor government will provide the leadership and direction our foreign service needs. We would ensure a more central role for foreign policy in the content and implementation of strategy. And we would be focused on the key task of maximising our influence in the reshaping of the region. These three elements of Australian foreign policy, projecting the reality of modern Australia, partnerships and capability, are also how we can shape the world for the better because it is in our national interest that we work to generate and preserve global public goods. Shaping the world for the better includes promoting issues and principles which we believe are of common benefit to all nations and all peoples. 
This is at the heart of Labor's foreign policy tradition. It requires not only effective multilateral capability in DFAT, but a clear mandate based on domestic priorities to prosecute these interests abroad. It is why we should have a more robust domestic framework to eliminate modern slavery. It's why we should inquire that our development assistance program has effective targets and oversight not only to alleviate suffering, but also to address the structural barriers that are holding women and girls back. It is why we should have Magnitsky sanctions and formalised engagement with NGOs to target those responsible for human rights abuses around the world. And why we must ensure in compliance with our nuclear non-proliferation commitments and redouble our efforts towards nuclear disarmament. This should be made an urgent priority for Australia and a starting point should be for the government to appoint a standalone ambassador for arms control and counter proliferation. The drivers of our expanded influence will work across all three core spheres of Labor's foreign policy, multilateralism, the region and our alliance with the United States. One of the most central multilateral groupings for our engagement is ASEAN, not, be, not just because of the centrality of ASEAN as entity, but also because of our geographic reality. Labor understands this, and we believe Australia can and should do more to demonstrate our ability to build trust and alignment with ASEAN leaders. As we made clear in our support for the AUKUS partnership, such engagement with our traditional partners must be in addition to more regional engagement, which is why, if elected, we will appoint an ASEAN special envoy, a roving high-level representative respected in the region to complement our diplomatic network and forge closer relationships with capitals. The countries of Southeast Asia have made clear they don't want to choose between the great powers, but they do want to exercise their own agency in how the region is being reshaped. And it's why I and many others have advocated for a settling point in the escalating strategic competition between the US and China, one that is favourable to the region and that upholds the rules of the road. President Biden has recognised the importance of managing this competition responsibly and the need to impose common sense guardrails to ensure competition does not veer into conflict. So we welcome reports that the US and China have agreed on the need to engage on nuclear and strategic stability issues, in addition to their collaboration on climate change. Clear and consistent communication and guardrails between the two powers will be vital in managing the growing number of potential flashpoints in our neighbourhood. The greatest risk to peace, stability and prosperity in our region is the risk, risk of conflict in Taiwan. That said, it is not a risk contained to our region. The consequences of a kinetic conflict over Taiwan, with the potential for escalation, would be catastrophic for humanity. And that is why successive Australian, American and regional governments have taken a careful and sober approach to cross-strait relations. It is not because everyone who has gone before us has been weak or afraid. It's because of a dispassionate, clear-eyed assessment of interests and because of the need to support the people of Taiwan and maintain regional stability. In Australia, this approach has involved the bipartisan adoption of a one China policy and advocacy to deter unilateral changes to the status quo. It is, it's not just the bipartisan Australian position, but the approach taken by successive US administrations since President Carter and reaffirmed recently by President Biden. Republic and Democratic administrations have also taken a deliberate position of strategic ambiguity in relation to Taiwan. In maintaining this position of strategic ambiguity, the US declines to declare a definitive position on military conflict including whether to join a war if one was started by others. And as a US ally, Australia has taken a position consistent with theirs. And this strategy has rightly been adopted as the path most capable of averting conflict and enabling the region to live in peace and prosperity. So when Peter Dutton talks about it being inconceivable that Australia would not join a war over Taiwan, he is wildly, wildly out of step with the strategy long adopted by Australia and our principal ally. Surely the real question is not, as he suggests, whether we declare our intentions, 
But why the Defence Minister is amping up war rather than working to maintain long-standing policy to preserve the status quo, as advocated by the Taiwanese leader, Tsai Ing-wen. Mr Dutton knows exactly what he is doing by using words like inconceivable in the same conflict in the same, Mr. Dutton knows exactly what he is doing by using words like inconceivable is in the same context as the threat of conflict, and after his former secretary declared the drums of war were beating. And it is notable that Mr. Morrison has not used the same febrile language, sticking more closely to Australia's traditional position. This is the same duplicitous game we see from the Morrison Joyce government in a range of areas, as with climate change. When Mr. Morrison makes empty promises to sound like he cares, when while Barnaby Joyce tells you what they really think. And here we have the same dynamic between Mr. Morrison and Mr. Dutton. But in this case, they play political games on something so grave as whether they commit Australia to war against the superpower. It has been widely reported that the Morrison government want to make national security a focus of the coming election. Amping up the prospect of war against a superpower is the most dangerous election tactic in Australian history. It is a tactic employed by irresponsible politicians who are desperate to hang on to power at any cost. And as the Lowy Institute's Natasha Kassam has pointed out, the PRC's narrative has long been that the only options available to Taiwan are unificational war. So Mr Dutton does Australians and Taiwanese no favours by amplifying Beijing's fatalism. This is the worst in a litany of cases of the Morrison-Joyce government seeking to use foreign policy and national security for political advantage. One of the most shameless examples is when Mr Morrison was asked a question about the French president calling him a liar. And he proved the point by telling a new lie, fabricating that the Labor leader, I'm going to quote this, the Labor leader backed in the Chinese government and a number of others by having a crack at me as well. It is true China has changed and our relationship has become harder to manage. But desperately playing politics on China whenever he is in trouble does nothing to strengthen Mr Morrison's authority with Australians or with Beijing. The underlying point, though, is now is that there is now an overwhelming body of evidence to show that Mr. Morrison's base instinct is always to lie and blame others. He lies about being at the front of the queue, about being in Hawaii during the bushfires, about electric vehicles and about vaccine mandates. He lies about the mistakes he makes, like describing Australia's position on Taiwan as one country, two systems. He lies about others like Anthony Albanese and even the French president. And then he tells new lies to deny his old lies. He has rendered his own word worthless and Australians can no longer believe a word he says. And neither can world leaders who will never trust him again after he leaked private text messages, which in fact proved that President Macron did not know what was coming, exposing another lie. Mr Morrison does not have the character to be the custodian of Australian interests in the world. And when he lies, Australia loses. Australia's leaders should take the world as it is and seek to shape it for the better. It's what we need now as much as we have ever needed it. And to expand Australia's power and influence, we need to set political interests aside from our national interests. We need to look beyond the news of the day. We need to focus on more than announcements. We need to do the whole job. We need foresight. We need to bring all the aspects of our statecraft together to protect and to advance our interests. We need to improve our performance across the whole range of capabilities required to shape outcomes in the world, including our effectiveness in navigating the grey zone. We need genuine partnerships grounded in trust. And we need to reach into the vast, untapped power of our people and project a confident, unified, modern Australia to the modern world. Thank you very much. Just making sure I get the right water, Rory. Could be embarrassing. Oops. All right, well, we're live. So thank you very much, uh, Senator. That was it was wide ranging. It was substantial. It was it was compelling. It will uh, attract uh, 
even more media interest perhaps than it already has. I've made Rory nervous. Uh, I've, I pointed out to him that it's okay, it's my words, not his. You know, not, not at all. No, look, I, look, I think the, the contest of ideas is what the university is about, as you know, so it's a real privilege to be a, a, a platform for that. I do want to open to questions from our audience, and not only do we have friends from the press here, but we also have ANU colleagues, including students, so I hope you're sharpening your questions as we as we speak. I might begin, if that's okay, to draw you out, particularly on the, uh, the Taiwan issue, because, uh, you know, at one level, as, as you know, uh, and I'm not alone in this, I've been a strong advocate of bipartisanship across the foreign and security policy spectrum. Um, at another level, there's no question that the Taiwan issue is of you know, increasing concern and, and salience in our, in our and everyone's debate in the region. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the message I, I draw from you is something along the lines that, um, that Labor would support, uh, if you like, the people or the society of Taiwan and regional stability at the same time, you know, you, you, you draw a distinction about the uh, some of the messages that we've been hearing uh, from some in the, in the government. Uh, one would argue that when it comes to regional stability, deterrence has a role to play. You've spoken about grey zone coercion, which I take to mean uh, the, I guess, a lot of the intimidation and the interference that we've seen from um, Beijing towards Taiwan, and they're, they're my words. Um, if the government is essentially expressing support for uh, a democracy of our size in our region against that kind of intimidation, what's wrong with that and what would Labor do differently? Well, um, obviously the, well, <laughs> the issue of Taiwan is just very <laughs> resonant, uh, is a finely balanced and complex issue. Uh, and you're correct to assess that the threat of conflict is, is rising. Uh, I think the question is, uh, what is it that Australia can do most uh, to preserve the status quo? You use the word deterrence, which is a, a word that focuses very much on uh, a sort of military deterrence. The point I'm making is that if you look at the history of a finely balanced position that different parties associated with the, 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 the issue in the Taiwan Straits has taken, whether it's US administrations, Australia, or, or the Taiwanese, um, and, and Beijing, uh, I'm making, uh, my, observe, my, my point is that our job is really to ensure that we create the disincentive collectively for conflict and continue to create as many incentives as possible for peace. Uh, and I accept it, this is uh, historically and now an issue where uh, there is, governments have recognised the, the, the downside of the sort of binary way Mr Dutton is construing it. I'm making a point that I, I do not believe, particularly given the US position, that that is the way in which we most are most likely uh, to create that incentive for the status quo. And that is what we have to do. I'm gonna... And I'll make a point about yeah, the region, please. actually. I mean, a thing we need to recall that uh, countries in the region may have different views about aspects of US-China competition, but the countries in the region do not want conflict. The countries in the region, our near region, uh, want the preservation of the status quo as the best way of maintaining um, peace and stability. Can I draw you out on one other, <coughs> pardon me, can I draw you out on one other point and then I'll go to the room. Projecting modern Australia, <coughs> which was a theme that you came back to a few times, uh, and that idea of I think in your, your words, amplifying Australia's influence through projecting modern Australia. I mean, at one level, that's a very fine um, aspiration. Uh, and in terms of uh, national identity or national values, I, I, I can see that. But in a practical sense, do you have any um, examples of where you would see that as being effective? 
Well, I think in part it is how the Foreign Minister and the Prime Minister of the day speak about who we are and how they speak in, about our place and our stake in the region and how you draw on aspects of who we are in your engagement with the region. Uh, and at times Australian, you know, the, the current government I think has, and I'll try to show, give you a couple of examples, but there's a bit of, bit of tone deafness around how this might be heard in other parts of Australia. I, I, I tell you where this comes from. I mean, there's lots of people have spoken about productive diversity and you know, multiculturalism, I think, uh, as, a, as a diplomatic kind of strength. But something happened years ago. Can I tell a quick anecdote? Right? Um, <clears throat> so my father, who when we left Malaysia, he stayed there until he was 75. Uh, and the first iteration of Pauline Hanson, so when she first called for, which first said, what was it? we were swamping Australia. Asian, Australia's in danger of being swamped by Asians. Uh, and I remember calling him. So Dad is an educated man. He was a Colombo Plan Scholar to Adelaide University, did architecture here in the 60s. So he, he's, he understands, you know, has that understanding of Australian politics and Australian society. And he said to me, do you want to come home? And I thought, this is really interesting. It shows the extent. Now, he and my mother married just at the end of the White Australia policy, but this was in what? 90s, was it? I think so. It, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> it shows, doesn't it, the extent to which even someone like him, as soon as that was said, what that evoked in him. And it, that stayed with me, actually, because it reminds us when engaging with the region, and, you know, diplomacy isn't just about being nice, it's about being persuasive. <laughs> um, how you, that, how we engage with them and what, what we speak to people uh, including, you know, talking about parts of the diaspora or engaging the diaspora with with the country in which you're dealing. These are very powerful um, as powerful narratives and powerful initiatives. I think. Thank you. We're going to open it up, uh, and so if anyone has a question or a comment, I haven't seen my glasses. But a question, so preferably, squinting, I'm not uh, 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 and a brief question in the room. I will come to you and I'm going to particularly keep an eye out for any of uh, the ANU students or uh, some of my younger colleagues um, and we'll work it from there. So uh, please, the floor is yours. It's your, it's your opportunity. If you if you don't ask now, you, you, you never will. I'm quite I'll nice. Begin, so yeah, off, all right. And it is very hard to see in this room. <laughs> so um, look, I'll, I'll actually begin at the front here and then I'll go to my colleague, Will Stoltz, next. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Please. Thanks very much for your comments, Senator Wong. Uh, I wanted to ask about Australia's experience of economic coercion by China in the last um, 18 months or so. Uh, what would you do differently? Mm, well, I, I, on this, there is clear bipartisanship. I mean, the, the, I have described China's behaviour across a range of contexts as not being the behaviour of a responsible global power. And I think that is the reason I said that was it, I was seeking to frame this as recognising these are not behaviours that those with power in an in a international system can engage with and have others um, believe that, that, you know, there is the capacity for cooperation. So, <clears throat> and China's behaviours in the trade uh, area are inconsistent with its commitments. This is the Australian position, its commitments in the WTO and chapter. And, um, you know, I think we uh, have to be very clearly and collectively from, from, from across the political spectrum and I think from, you know, people like those represented here um, uh, ex pushed back on. Um, uh, it is an example of where we are in the China relationship and the China relationship, you know, China has changed, our nature of the relationship has changed. Uh, and there will be enduring differences that need to be managed and dealt with by whomever, whoever is in government. And that, that will not change. And I think of it as these are the structural aspects of the relationship. Uh, it doesn't, however, we know that we have to continue to engage. Uh, and the question for governments uh, over the coming years is how, what does that, how, how to do that? And how do we do that in a way that recognises these and manages these differences which are going to endure? Thank you. And we'll take um, a question over in the far 
uh, the room, I'll start with my colleague from uh, the National Security College, Will Stoltz, and then I'll move around. Thank you. Thank you, Rory, and thank you, Senator, on a very engaging uh, speech this morning. Um, you mentioned that if elected, your government um, would be uh, bringing more credibility to the Pacific step up. I'd like to um, tease you out to kind of bring some more detail to that. Um, you mentioned uh, climate change as being a big aspect of that um, effort. Uh, it all, I also know that there's a degree of unresolved business in relation to the status of West Papua and Bougainville that, that may arise in the next decade or so. I'd be interested to kind of tease out your thoughts on, on those thorny issues as well. Oh. And, and from here on, one question per Yeah, per, yeah. Per, can, per I, can I just do it? Uh, West Papua and Bougainville. Can we, <laughs> let, I might just leave those for another time if I may, but I will deal with the first one. The Pacific is, the point I was trying to make in the, in the, the contribution on that actually was uh, and in part, I draw on my experience when I was climate minister, and we worked quite closely with Pacific Island nations in different form. You know, they had different um, was it small island developing states, and, and, and um, as well as the PIF in the context of the conference, the parties on climate. And we worked quite closely with them. And my observation then, and then I was, I did a bipartisan trip to the Pacific twice with Julie Bishop, and those experiences really reinforced for me the extent to which climate change in uh, for, for these nations is not the same identity, contested identity issue that it is here in Australia. All right, so the, the point about climate in Australia and why we've been unable to progress the issue is it has become an identity issue. So actually the policy, we, we know what we need to do, but we've been unable to do it because we've been locked into a very bitter, unproductive identity argument. What is fascinating when you visit the Pacific is it isn't that for them. So you have quite conservative people of, of faith, leading countries, who will talk to you about this as the critical issue for them. So when we throw a lot of money at them, and I could point to some of, you know, um, Bainamarama's comments or Anote Tong's comments, etc. But when you, when you, when we just say, "Hey, here's here's all this money, and and, and you know, we're going to work with you," but we fundamentally don't listen and understand that for them, this is an this is a present existential economic national security risk that they are managing and seeking to manage, and and how difficult that is for them. I, I don't see how you build credible durable partnerships if there fundamentally is not that re recognition of that experience. Now, we will have more to say about this, and I'm very privileged to have Pat Conroy working with me, who is a very, very good policy person on the Pacific, and we'll say more about specifically Pacific and, and ODA, but uh, I do think it is uh, if you do not have a government that actually is prepared to act on climate in its domestic policy, I don't see how you can actually deal with the Pacific on the basis of what they they identify as their priorities. Thank you. We're going to take three more questions in quick succession because I know if I do that, then you won't dare dodge the hard ones. You'll you'll um, you'll, you'll take them all, uh, but it also gives more of our colleagues. It will give more of our colleagues. It will give more of our colleagues. I am. It will give more of our colleagues to say. Um, so I'm actually going to go to I'm going to take Senator a night, Bell, who yeah. I saw earlier, and then Ingrid in the far corner. Uh, Genevieve, please. Thank you so much for that, Senator Wong. I guess in reflecting on that notion of the three pieces that you were talking about, the idea of narrative, the idea of collaboration, and the idea of capability building, I'm interested in where you think technology flows through all of that. And uh, Ingrid, Ingrid Lennon. Thank you, Rory, and thank you, Senator Wong, for today's presentation. I had a question about the art of statecraft. Um, in particular, a lot of the challenges that Australia faces are much more than foreign policy challenges. A lot of it relates to what you spoke on, um, diversifying not only our trading partners, but what we offer, um, championing the diversity of modern Australia, as well as adopting renewable energy sources. But at the same time, by virtue of our democracy, our leaders are beholden to short-term um, priorities, um, bureaucratic and political forces. So how would a Labor government um, practice the art of statecraft and achieve and address some of the domestic socio-economic reforms that underpin foreign policy challenges? 
Thank you. Thank you. And then final question. I think uh, John Blacksland uh, down the front was, uh, was was waiting a while, so we'll, we'll give you the last the last question, John, because you're a smorgasbord uh, senator. Yeah, thanks very much, Rory and Senator Wong. Um, you didn't touch on all at all on the Quad or Indonesia. I just wonder. Or the Indo-Pacific. I realised partway through this. Yeah, so just I would usually make sure I actually say it because Rory is here. <laughs> Otherwise, I get a black mark. So I'm just wondering how how they weigh in your mind. How do India? Oh, sorry, the Quad and what was the last one? Indonesia. Oh, yeah. So India, Japan, Indonesia. Yep. So. All right, there's three very good questions, if I may say. Uh, the first one was technology, the role of technology, uh, and I'm glad you actually heard what I said about the three bits. I was like, thank you for hearing that. Hello? Yep, okay. Uh, I, I see technology as particularly... Okay, I'm cutting out. Tech, speaking of we're technology... Back. We're back. We're yeah. back. Um, I see technology as relevant to... We're not back. We're not back. It's very ironic. <laughs> there you go. We, we scripted that. I see technology is relevant, particularly to the, the second two, so the nature of partnerships and also capability. Um, obviously, so, so, for example, uh, obviously, in terms of cyber, we could do more there. Um, in terms of collaboration, I think Dorcas is a good example of great deeper formalising the deep techn te technical and technological cooperation we have with the UK and the US. So I see technology as a domain in which all three of those, but particularly the, the second two, uh, can be expanded. Are we getting... Do I have to keep shouting? No. Um, secondly, statecraft. I, I actually was trying to talk about statecraft. Maybe I should have made that clear. I, 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 did, I think I only used the word a couple of times because other than people who study um, you know, international relations. It's 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 not a it's not a term that most people understand. But what I was tr actually trying to lay out was uh, essentially a proposition around um, competent state and effective statecraft, which is how do you utilise all aspects of national power? And I think there's a paragraph where I talk about economic, military, economic, strategic, economic, social. Um, something else, can't remember. <laughs> um, uh, because my point is that sometimes the discussion uh, becomes very narrow. And when we are, and that, that you know, human beings like that, we like clarity, we like to make things simple, uh, and so it's much easier to deal with a, a narrow, simple con concept than to try and deal with the multiplicity. But my point is we're, we're in a reshaping of our region, and so the complex task for leaders is to actually think about how it is that you utilise all these aspects of, of, of national power. And I, that's why Engaging Minds for a Secure Australia, the work that you do here is so important because that is precisely the debate or the discussion that you're engaged in. Uh, John, there was nothing, you know, I've given speeches and written op-eds about the Quad and I've talked a lot about Indonesia really. It was just that I wanted in this speech, uh, so there were lots of things I could have spoken about. Uh, and I will, but I wanted in this speech to really try and get a stronger sense of the place of foreign policy uh, in the operation of, of state, statecraft, because I think it is important for us to think uh, a little more laterally about how we engage, how we shape, uh, engage in the shaping, reshaping of our region, how we amplify our power and influence to that end. Uh, so I promise you I will speak more about particularly Indonesia and uh, before the election. Do I cover everything? Yeah. I think I think you 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 dodged none. So I think the um and, and the the ASEAN envoy is another theme that I think we'd love to tease out if we had more time. So we'll have to pause that now. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here today. I'm going to in a moment invite uh, my colleague uh, Professor Helen Sullivan to give the vote of thanks. But just uh, on a personal note from me, Senator, thank you for bringing us into the the contest uh, of ideas today.